All right, hi and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Gender Fluidity, Technology and Futurism panel uh, with Carter Manier, Jeremy Ceres, Kevin Chap, and Rio Aubrey Taylor. Um, so Carter, do you want to wave so they know? It's Carter. So Carter Manier is a cartoonist living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her upcoming book, I Want to Be Evil, is being published by 2D Cloud. Um, Carter is also one of the hosts of the extremely popular indie podcast, We Should Be Friends. Her ambition is to become the world's first ever sad cartoonist. Um, some of her work. And the next one introduces uh, Jeremy Cerise. Um Jeremy Cerise is a cartoonist currently based out of Brooklyn, New York City. Um, Jeremy was a resident of the La Maison des Arturs, a comic-specific residency program in Angoulême, France, where he lived and worked from 2012 to 2013. His first book, Curveball, published with No Brow, came out in 2015 and was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award. His most recent book, The Tar Pit, has just been published with Shortbox. So, that's Jeremy's stuff. Okay. So, Kevin Chap is our next one, Kevin. Um, Kevin Chap is a Providence-based cartoonist and runs the Micropress Chap Books and co-publishes Ley Lines with El Nichols Me. Um, Chap received the CXC Emerging Talent Award in 2016 and is currently the fellow at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Their comic, Fuchi Proof, was just released by Uncivilized Books. Um, and Rio Aubrey Taylor. Rio Aubrey Taylor, who also goes by Rhea, is a multidisciplinary cartooner, magic worker, and non-binary trans woman. Z possesses an MFA from the Center for Cartoon Studies and has been called the trippiest of the CCS cartoonist by comics critic Rob Clough. Living and dying in the queer South, Z regularly guest teaches at both Duke University and the University of North Carolina. Their current major project is the experimental comic series Jetty, which was recently named on the Comics Journal's Best Short Form Comics of 2016 list. All right. So, hi. Do you guys want to um, make sure? Do Who you are you, Will? Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm moderating the panel. <laughs> this is about you guys. <laughs> um, so do you want to maybe say a thing like which table you're at if you're at a table? Do you have your books? Anything you want to add to my intro? Uh, we can start from Rio and go okay. that way. Hi. I don't have a table this year, but I just completed Jetty number nine, and I have about 300 copies of them here for free. So if anybody wants one after the talk, please come see me. And I also have all of the other uh, issues of Jetty if anybody wants some of those. Thank you. And I'm at uh, table L1, and um, I have copies of Fiji Perf and all the stuff that Chapbooks puts out and ley lines. I'm at table E6 with Carolyn Nowak. I have copies of my book Secure Connect as well as a couple of shirts. Um, one of them says Goth Bitch on Patrol. <laughs> it's a uh, collaboration with uh, M. Partridge, the very popular M. Partridge. And then the other one says Femme de la Femme. Um, and you are more than welcome to buy them. Um, I would I would encourage you to. Um, and I'm also occasionally at the 2D Cloud table. I'm at the I'm at K14. I'm right next to Eleanor Davis. 
Um, I have copies of Curveball, as well as uh, small drawing collections, one called Lookbook, which is like fashion drawings, another one that's called You Made My Day, which is like snoop drawings of do people that I see on the bout. Uh, and then I have a collection of the drawing, um, the new collection called The Tar Pit, which put out, was put out by Shortbox this year. Uh, and then Mia has uh, something to say. I wanted to take a moment to recognize the life of Derricka Banner. A few days ago, she became the 20th known trans person in the U.S. to be killed in the year 2017. She was killed in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's, North Carolina is the state that I live. And currently in North Carolina, there are no laws that consider killing someone based on their gender identity or sexual orientation to be a hate crime. Uh, right now, as we speak in North Carolina, trans pride is happening in Charlotte, and I'm sure that a lot of my friends are probably there mourning her death, and I wanted to mention it here because black trans lives matters. So rest in power, Derricka Banner. All right. Um, so my first question, I have just for their general questions so anyone can answer. Um, so historically, sci-fi is very dismissive of works by women and other minorities by calling them soft, like soft sci-fi. Um, like Ursula Le Guin is one of the examples, like who I personally love, but like, I feel like a lot of people overlook her. Do you find that people view your work as sci-fi? Why or why not? And do you find that their answer is different, like if you're in different groups of people? Um, I, I have an answer. Okay. Um, I often say, I often get told that I'm science fantasy, which I think is very <laughs> interesting to me because it's, and it's usually that uh, the people who tell me this are usually straight men. And it, it used to bother me, I think when the book first came out, I was sort of a little grumpy about it because I was like, well, like, you don't have to like the book, that's fine. Like, I understand it's not for everybody, but to like make the caveat, to make the differentiation feels like a reach. It felt like it was trying really hard to like put me in my place. But now I think anytime someone tells me that, I love it because I know I've like I've like crossed their I've like crossed a line for them. I've like played with their toys and they like can't get them back now. And so I think now it's the thing of like anytime I make I'm like working on another sci-fi book and it feels like a compliment. I feel like I'm like leaning into it even more to be like because I think the thing is that for them science fiction feels like they want to feel like they're smarter by having read science fiction. It's like something that's done a ton of research to sort of cobble together a world that like works by its own logic and sort of something that feels, especially if there's so many science fiction authors who are like failed intellectuals, like men who like <laughs> had all this like wanted to be an amazing like professor or something. And like I always think about, he's not sci-fi, but J like, um, Tolkien. Tolkien. Tolkien was like the shame of his school. Like everyone thought he was the biggest dweeb ever, because they would just feel like there's accounts of like his cl like fellow teachers being like, if I have to sit with Tolkien and have him talk to me about elves one more time, <laughs> I'm gonna lose it. And so I think of like in that way of like those people being considered like the high genre fiction mm -hmm. and recognizing that they often were sort of men that were like grumpy about their own station life. I think it's made me appreciate that it's like. There is, there is more room for us to sort of squeeze into that, and it's like, it's just them sort of like bucking back because they're, they're worried about losing whatever placehold they have on science fiction. Anyone else? Uh, when my grandparents ask what I'm doing, I tell them I do science fiction because it's easier than saying like, um, I do like, semi-autobiographical comics about trauma, but like people come out of computers. Um, I don't know, like it's an interesting question because uh, nobody has ever told me what genre my work is. Usually it's like, what, you know, like they say, like, what is this? Um, so I don't know if I have anything that constructive to add to what Jeremy said, other than like anybody who says your work isn't sci-fi is a nut. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm only really, um, I know maybe one person who's like a super hardcore sci-fi like geek in the uh, classical sense, and 
I'm pretty sure by their standards, like whatever I do would not be considered, but I guess beyond that, it doesn't occur to me. It's not like circles intersect where that would cause some sort of controversy, so. I've never called my work science fiction, but I think people have looked at the cover and seen that there's like a, a robot on it and called it science fiction, but I usually call it experimental comics or psychedelic comics. Um, so in your works, all, all of you, like there's either like a, they're very queer, like clearly, but, um, and so one of the things I wonder is that like, especially with gender fluidity, like comics is a visual medium. And is there any specific thing to comics that you've run across about depicting gender fluid characters or transness um, that would be specific to comics that would, like maybe you can do in comics but not in prose or vice versa? And like what do you think the strengths of comic are, comics as a medium is for telling these types of stories? So like Sarah Horrocks says something really smart, um, which is that comics are like a really perfect medium for depicting trans characters because you don't have to deal with like the difficulties of like either a cis actor playing a trans person or like a trans person at a certain point in their transition trying to play a trans person at a certain other point in their transition. Um, you're able to depict someone like in a very controlled kind of way, you know, like this person is trans, but like the reader, generally speaking, isn't able to like hear their voice or like um, you are in control of like those little clockable cues or whatever. So I think it's a very powerful medium for depicting transness because you can depict like um, a lot of different kinds or aspects of it, you know, like just in, in terms of like uh, you can do an aspirational transness where, like, you're very beautiful or whatever, and you can do, like, oh, this is how I feel when kind of, like, um, you know, like, Emil Ferris, my favorite thing is monsters, like, draw yourself as a fucking troll kind of transness. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's a powerful medium for that because it, it is a, uh, a medium that allows a creator a certain amount of um, control that you don't necessarily have in prose where you would need to be like, you know, all of that, like, her Adam's apple caught the light, you know, kind of. <laughs> um, you know, in comics, you can, hint, you can hint at it, like, in a little bit more tasteful of a way. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> what uh, I like about um, using comics for things like that is sort of the... Um, Kind of what you were just hinting at in the end of that. Um, it's just like you can get away with a lack of specificity. You can like <coughs> display something because so much of gender is about like display and performance. And um, but just like showing something how it is, and it's not like you need to write a sentence to describe that. Like, well, this is what's going on here. Or, like setting up with words. It's just like. A, an image or you can get more abstract with things to sort of convey a feeling or almost like a metaphorical um, expression of these ideas. And again, it's like not, and I guess that's kind of like ties into the fluidity of gender fluidity. It's like there's not an answer mm -hmm. or like explanation of what, how this fits into somebody's like understanding of how the world works. It's like, this is just what's happening on the page right here. Right. Yeah, that's something I actually really love about um, your drawings, mm -hmm. is that I feel like they've become this thing of like, it, it sort of depicts a, a wide range of people, and I think it allows you as the reader to engage with it, where it's sort of this thing where it's like, you, there are some times where it's more intimate with certain characters, but often when it's like a crowd of them like running and dancing and doing whatever it is that they want to do, there is this feeling that it's like, it's none of your business. It's just like a beautiful thing that is like mm -hmm. existing on its own without qualifiers. And I think that's something within, with Curveball that I didn't expect was that, I think it became, all the characters that are more ambiguous, I think they sort of became a, a, a vessel for the readers to be like, oh, well that's how I was reading it based off my own experience. And as an author, it's been very liberating to sort of let go of that like, it used to be very like, 
obsessive, very like control freak about the things I was making, very like cross hatch heavy, and very like the stories had to be exactly this one way. You can only read it this one way, and having people look at the way just by the fact that I'm drawing certain people a certain way, sort of reading into it and sort of having more intimacy or more intimate relationship with it than I could have I could have spelled out on my own. You know, it sort of became something beyond what I could have. I've you know. It, it's been so much more intimate that way and become so much more personal. If I can jump in again, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like, uh, I guess comics and movies both have this to some extent where you're also not bound by, like, you know, in prose, you're bound to pronouns when you introduce a character or whatever, but in comics, you're not. So, like, when somebody walks into a room in a comic, you don't immediately have to... Um, cue the reader to the fact that they are a trans person or that they're presenting differently or whatever. That's something that can happen much more subtly and in a much more affirming kind of way. Um, and I think, again, like more powerfully in comics and in movies because you're not being cued off by like all of the small things that like a real human lets on. Like you can really bias the portrayal in a way that like um, doesn't like immediately fall into this trap of being like, well, here's a trans character, and immediately I want to disclose that to you because it's important that this is a trans character. Instead, you can do this thing where like it sort of gently becomes apparent, or maybe doesn't even become apparent. And I always appreciate that in storytelling, um, like which trade does that, and um, some of a. Uh, Like uh, Remy Boydell's work does that. Um, Rory Francis's work does that. Um, and I think that's a very powerful thing in comics. I'd also like to say that um, as a cartooner, I think comics are a perfect medium for me to present trans stuff because I draw. So I tend to present my own transition uh, spread across the various characters and not just through time, so it's spread out through space too. So um, like my comic is a weird comic, but it's also like autobiographical. I had a friend ask me once, trying to figure out which character was supposed to represent me, and I said, well, they all represent me, um, but they're all kind of drawn different depending on the circumstance and whatever they're going through. So because I have complete control over what they look like, I can show different aspects of myself through the various characters. Yeah. Anything else anyone would like to add? I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really like that too. <laughs> yeah, so basically it seems that like, um, it, it sounds like including gender fluidity in your books makes the reading of the book also more fluid for like the people reading it, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really interesting thing that comics can bring. Um, so. How do you feel that gender fluidity fits in with like a utopian ideal? Because like, I know Kevin, your book, like it's very much like positive, future Cleveland. Like, you know, there's like, I mean, there's like kind of an idealized like way of wanting the world to be, even when it's falling apart. And like your, the other works of you guys. Um, so I was wondering how gender fluidity fits with this and do you think that technology can help or hurt gender fluidity in these, you know, in your portrayals. Well, I think for me, as a cis man, I feel like sci-fi and moving into more gender fluid characters, at least being very aware of how I'm presenting gender in my comics, I feel like Curveball was a really good, very tough lesson in many ways, where I, I would make a draft of it, and I'd give it to someone, and they'd be like, you don't understand something. And they would, I would like go back through and work it, and like fix it, and it, it became this thing where I was like, present, taking myself out of my own sort of understanding of things, and sort of to really putting myself into this place where I had to be better. And I think remove it, like little things where it's like early drafts of Curveball, I like love old rom-coms, like 90s, eight, like you, I could go on and on. This could, I could be a panel about Nora Ephron right now and Minstruck and we would be here for three days. But it's the thing with so many of those movies is they end in very gendered terms where characters move through broken hearts by finding someone new. And that was sort of an early draft of Curveball where Avery was gonna find like a new person to fall in love with. And it was this thing where I was like, 
that's actually, I was like in the moment where I was like, that's a horrible end. And that's, but it's because I'm so used to like gendered stories influencing everything I've ever consumed as a reader, as a, as a viewer, and moving to a place where I was like, okay, if the story can't focus on, if, the, if I have to remove gender from it, like what can I do with the story now? If I'm removing, moving away from cliches that I've, I've come to accept as sort of like my reality, like how can I be a better storyteller, like I could be more inclusive, how can I sort of challenge what and how a story operates if I'm moving away from the expected, which I think gender has so many things that are like wrapped up to it, even if you don't quite, even if you're not aware of it, like I wasn't, it's so easy to sort of like, oh, actually, I don't, if I like remove that, I can do anything, but that's like so many other possibilities. Yeah. Or then even like with the, I'm working on a sequel to Curveball now, which is like almost entirely about cisgender men and so their, their relationship with each other and then also and like gayness and it's a horror story, it's a whole thing. But um, with that of like presenting the opposite where it's like, okay, if I'm very explicit about someone's gender in the story, like how can I be constructive about it? How can I be challenging to it? How can I sort of talk about shitty things that come with that? And then also balance it out with things that are more vague and more complicated and sort of like push those, push those gendered for, uh, gender, non-gendered forces against each other narratively, if that makes any sense. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, do you want to go? Um, that's a really fun question and like, especially when I think about utopian visions or like trying to create like something that's fun or interesting to read, like, Something that I often try to keep in mind is that, like, like uh, idealism or utopia doesn't like necessarily indicate like um, a washing away of like identifiers, but instead of like an awareness of them. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's you know, like, if we're really talking about like utopian vision or whatever, like, there are still going to be people who identify certain ways or like want to do certain things or be certain ways, but, like, instead of that being considered, like, you know, like, things like white patriarchy being considered the norm, like, there's more of an awareness of, like, okay, I'm this kind of person, and that comes with this kind of baggage or, like, this this kind of um, problems. Um, and, like, sort of identifying the intersections and ways that technology can, like, assist with those. Um, you know, like... <coughs> some of the work I'm doing right now has to do with like an intersection between transness, disability, and technology. And so like, it's very easy on the surface to be like, okay, like it would be fun to have a robot body, you know, like that way I wouldn't have these body problems. Um, but then also I think it's more fun to think like, wouldn't that be fucked up? You know, like, uh, what, what if, you know, like what if only some people could get robot bodies, you know, and then, um, and then I've created like a bad 80s action sci-fi movie. Um, but like in, thinking about the intersection of those things is especially where I think it's fun. Um, you know, like people are able to be fluid in their gender and like people are able to talk about the things that they would be doing anyway, you know, with or without this utopian society and with or without this technology. And like the technology and the story is often used as like an excuse to have these things happen. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I think that answers. Karda, um, <laughs> have you ever read um, Monk of the Metropolarity Group? Um, no. They have a, a series of stories, kind of like this universe that goes under the title of Cyborg Memoirs. Mm -hmm. Kind of what you were describing, that like, oh, having a robot body, but that would suck. And, it's very, very good. For the record, if, it if anybody here knows about a robot body, please talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, those, those cyborg memoirs are very good. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to say, a lot of what um, sort of the utopic future stuff in Fiji Perf was coming out of just like, uh, I wish. <laughs> just like wish things would just be like better, you know, like fill in the blank, but just like how do you do that? It's like, well, let's just skip that part and like right. it's all better and it's sort of like, oh yeah, it'd be cool if we could do all this stuff, but then you think about, well, what is sort of backtracking, like what is the means to get there? It's like, oh, have all this future stuff look like the Jetsons. It's like, oh, well that means that like 
capitalism would never end and it just like kept getting worse it's like oh no so it's like well <laughs> just, there's a story that's kind of explains like this whole society runs on basically free renewable energy that somehow it's coming out of Lake Erie we don't quite know <laughs> why or how but that's how everybody can afford to like be happy but um so yeah when I think about technology it is if you don't even need to dig too deeply then you start thinking about like access and like who can do these yeah. things like where is it coming from what is the trade-off um, so it's it's tough <laughs> <laughs> I would never. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that's why it's nice to dream. <laughs> yeah, it's important to have dreamers. I've never written about utopias before because my worldview is essentially a Buddhist one, where I look at everything as being inherently dissatisfactory. So, when I look into the future, um, I don't actually see, no matter how far the technology goes, as anyone, as it reaching across the board of everyone actually being happy. I feel like in my own vision of the future, what a great utopia would be with just everyone having basic human rights at least. And then uh, in my own life, technology has affected me a lot because I'm able to take hormones and gender non-conforming people, you know, 300 years ago weren't able to do that. So I imagine that in the future, people will start moving forward in a lot of different ways uh, than anybody can really imagine right now. I think trans people are basically on the vanguard of transhumanism. So. Um, I don't really explore that a lot in my comic, though, because I actually more talk about magic, really, than technology, to be honest. <laughs> um, no, that, that's a really good point. There's something I think about a lot, actually, is uh, technology in, like, enabling gender expression, like the fact that like, you know, I can take hormones and like, grow a beard, and, like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it makes me a lot happier. Right. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, what do you guys see the role of technology in gender as being? Like, that's one of them, but like, are there other technologies that enable gender expression? Um, can you imagine, like, what would you like idealize in the future this to be? You mean like graphical user interfaces? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what about the internet? Yeah. yeah I mean, like, the, you give a kid a forum, and they're gay, they're gay immediately. <laughs> I yeah, actually have a really good story about that. Um, I was like, I was thinking, because I feel like there's like a huge, like, as like a, with gay media, I feel like it's always very like pandery, which is something I always get really nervous about of like, like I never want to ever make, not to be like, you can totally make coming out stories if that makes you happy, but it's like the thing that would like, I would never ever make a coming out story. Um, but I was, can I always think about this mama I was at this party like two years ago, and there was this woman who had moved to New York specifically to get a job, uh, to take a job at like an LGBT youth center. And she was like, I'm queer, I'm so excited to like hang out with these 14 year olds and be like, you can be queer too and that's okay. And like help them through what she for her was a very tough, it was a really tough moment in her life. Yeah. And then she took the job and of course all the kids had like been on Tumblr for like a decade. Right. And they're like, they're like, these are my pronouns. I'm an anarchist. And she's like, well, okay, like. <laughs> And she, like, her, whole, her whole job was like explaining what anarchy was to 14 year olds because right. they had like consumed a ton of the internet and like had just regurgitated all these things that they had right. heard. And so when I ever think about making work and that sort of like presents sort of like what I consider like stories that are presenting to straight, to straight people, which I feel like like coming out stories so often feel very pandery in that way. I'm always like, there are 14 year olds, by the, by the time I make another graphic novel and they're like in college, they have like no need right. for the like coming out story. Like gen the internet has helped them yeah. sort of take this like really uncomfortable stuff, at least for me, take it really quickly and then have to be able to like, what is it, what do you need storytelling wise right. that doesn't need that, doesn't require that foundation of like, oh, it's okay to be gay. It's like, that's like, that's we're over that. That's beyond. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not okay not to be gay. <laughs> um, I mean, like, technology represents, like, a lot of access and communication, right? So, like, it's pretty incredible at this point that, like, you can have, like, kids taking puberty blockers. And, like, um, I'm friends with a now 15-year-old um, trans boy. And, like, before he was able to come out, like, his primary method of gender expression was 
um, he would like play as a male character on his Minecraft server. And it's like, you know, shit. Like, I was like um, growing up like with the internet, and still for me, I was like um, surprised to find a book in the library that mentioned gayness. And now it's like, you know, kids are able to do a lot more secret smart things. Um, thanks to technology. So, like, when we talk about technology in regard to gender, there's a lot of, like, very literal physical stuff that we talk about. You know, like, cyber wombs and cyber wombs. But uh, <laughs> there's, like, just on a much more basic level, like, the ability for everybody to have their own handheld computer that you can look at whatever you want at any time, secretly. Um, I think that opens up a ton of doors for young queer people and people who might in, you know, like other centuries not have been able to question or identify themselves as anything other than like whatever very limited set of gender expressions existed. Um, you know, like a lot of kids are non-binary now. Like that, and I say now as if like they weren't always, but like they're able to identify as non-binary now because like that's a concept that exists and is accessible to kids. Um, and I think like that more than anything else is like the modern triumph of queer technology. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Anyone have anything else to add? The, the, uh, just the flip side of that also is not having access to things that yeah. we need, especially as trans people. Just on a side note, that's why it pisses me off when I meet green anarchists who are all about the collapse of the world and they can't wait to see everything fall. It just really makes me angry because then um, I'm not going to get what I need. So right. I don't really like looking at the world in that perspective. Just a little side. <laughs> yeah, that's like... Um Right after I got out of college, I think I heard an interview with Derek Jensen, and like I started going down that whole thing, and it's like, wow, this is really cool, and then like, oh yeah, he's super like, transness doesn't exist, and right. like, yeah, so it's usually hiding not too far under the surface. Right, like if you have to tear down all of society, I would make a personal request that you keep whatever factory makes Zoloft and estrogen <laughs> um, and also chips. <laughs> That's uh <laughs> well, no, no, uh, we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone on either side. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. There's so many of you here, it's so stressful. Yeah, this is really <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to say it. If you think you want to boost the subject and maybe a mishap or something, which I guess I have no excuse for because I was right there, but uh, what are your thoughts on cyberneticism and how that might play in the future of gender identity? It's good. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with access again. So like, you know, like we could get into like a much more boring conversation, but like I have real fucked up body and it would be really nice if I could have a not as fucked up body. And like that would play into my own gender expression because then I would be able to present in a like more functional human way. Um, and I think for a lot of people it would play into it like that, you know, like, if it would make you feel more, you know, complete to have like a badass cyber arm, like wh why the fuck not? Like, I have no problem with that. A trans male friend of mine showed me an article he was reading uh, where they're theorizing on a cyber penis that you could connect to yourself with a magnet and then control with your iPhone. And he said that was not too far away, so that's kind of neat. <laughs> Yeah, if you're pretty woefully ignorant about the uh, current state of tech and cybernetics or what have you, so. Yeah, I always feel like it goes back and forth with me where I have like, have moments 
I don't know. I feel like technology is just really scary to me these days. Like there's that I like refuse to le read that article, which it just keeps popping up, and I'm like, no, I'm gonna have nightmares about the like technology that can scan your face and tell if you're gay or not. I'm like, no, 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 I'm out. Yeah, you should read it because it's basically like if you wear a hat, like they will. Yeah, out. right. Oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> good plot twist. Um, so yeah, I feel like, but at the same time, it's like there are moments where. Like even little stuff, I like did, I feel like I hate telling the story because it is always so embarrassing, but I did VR for the first time recently and it was amazing. But it was this funny thing of like VR feeling like it resting on like such a scary corporate entity. Right. And then you do Google Earth and you're like, it's amazing. Right. So it's this thing of like, it feels like I go back and forth where I'm like, I love that possibility. I sort of love the like impossible imagination that technology like allows us to have, like cyber pieces attaching to magnets and things like that. But I'm also like very, very wary. So there's an exoskeleton thing that came out recently to help people who work in factories primarily, but it's like, um, it like looks like uh, metal you know, bars or whatever that are sort of on your legs with joints. And then you can hit a button and it locks in place and you can just sit down wherever you are. That's the fucking best. <laughs> I want that real bad. Like that represents good technology to me. <laughs> that I could sit down wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted. <laughs> All right, next question. <clears throat> okay, well, I've been listening to you guys talk about this and thinking about technology. I'm a science fiction writer. I'm also cis. I'm a cis woman. And so I don't really understand transness or gender fluidity from the inside the way. And one of the things I was thinking about is there's a science fiction trope which is one of those things that could become reality is augmented reality, which we're seeing the first hints of with, the, with Pokemon Go. That's probably, but one of the tropes of that is being a, is if anyone, other people in the system, you in the real world can appear as anything you want to the other. And I wonder how that would intersect with transness and the level of gender presentation, particularly for people whose gender presentation shifts with that as it sometimes does, and read how much that would impact dysphoria and presentation. And I'd just like to get some trans responses on that because I'm not trans, I don't get it. Do you want to go? It would be awesome. Yeah, right? You can look any way you want it. I mean, I did that a little bit when I was in middle school. I'm much older than I look. When I was in middle school, uh, I would go on AOL Instant Messenger and like chat rooms and stuff and just be a girl then. I didn't even know I was trans. I was just like, OK, I'm a girl now when I'm in the chat room. Uh -huh. um, if you could do that in real life, that would be rad. Yeah. I mean, like, I think. It would be good for everyone, you know, like to, because like if you could do that and like play around with it, like why not? Like a lot of people would find out things about themselves, but like it's less limiting, you know, like and in terms of dysphoria, that would be an exciting option. But like I think it would be good for everybody's mental health if you could suddenly appear as like a giant, strong, eight foot tall, beautiful woman. Like <laughs> I don't, that seems wonderful. I think my I second those um, those thoughts, but I guess my response to that is just like that all sounds really cool as long as we can cover the base where you go outside and don't get attacked or murdered yes. and yeah. or like fucked with in any way. So it's sort of like how far can you like extend that sort of cloak right. over yourself and how just like, how does it interface with um, the flesh world? <laughs> the flesh world. The flesh world. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hello. Um, I actually have a question in regards to, we've been talking a lot about futurism and, and queerness in the context of the future and even in the present with regards to technology. And I know this is obviously the theme of the talk, but I was actually really interested in your thoughts, both as creators and as uh, you know, trans people and, and queer people, um, representing queerness and uh, 
trans people and gender fluidity in historical context um, because I think something that while futurism is wonderful because we can posit so many things I think there is in mainstream literature this concept that like gay people didn't exist or that queer people or trans people or non-binary people didn't exist um, so how can authors or cartoonists who are working within a non-fantasy historical setting uh, bring that kind of representation in a, in a setting that doesn't really have the, di like the dialogue or the labels that we have now. And I'm just curious about your, your thoughts on that. I would encourage you to listen to the podcast One from the Vaults by Morgan M. Page, mm -hmm. um, which is specifically a like trans history podcast um, that focuses on like uh, historical records of transness, mm -hmm. like in the farther past and then in the more recent past. It's excellent, and like there's a fair amount of good scholarship being done into um, like historical queerness, I guess we could say broadly. Um, I mean, like I guess like as long as you're starting from the point that's like okay, like it, this is not like a brand new concept created by the like decadence of capitalism or whatever. <laughs> like we can sort of like assume that there were you know, at whatever point you're going, like, gay people, trans people, um, then, like, sort of approaching historical records with, like, uh, that sort of care. Um, but, like, there is a lot of good research being done into it, and, mm -hmm. and I would say, like, um, looking into the work of trans historians is, like, a very good place to start. Mm. And there could be some, like, cool potential there of you someone were to link up with um, somebody doing this kind of research and sort of like collaborate on a project or even just like help each other to further because it really I think it does come down to that sort of scholarship and research needing to be unearthed and published and like disseminated because that's sort of like you know tumblr and what have you has spread what's available right. as far as it can but there's always more to be dug up and recontextualized mm -hmm. right so yeah just put together i was um when i first made curveball i was sort of like going from this utopic thing of like i just wanted it to be good and i sort of like did as best of my best of a job as i could to sort of like find conflict within like a sort of a queer utopic future but as I've gotten older and done research and read up on everything I can about gay history and, and meeting older gay people, I was realizing I actually did like a really bad job of sort of like placing curveball within like a world that had problems before. I sort of like made a clean slate. Mm -hmm. And so I just put out a book called The Tar Pit with short box. Yes, um, and so for that as a gay man, it was this thing of like getting older and wanting to see things that I hadn't seen in stories before, and so the tar, the tar Pit, it's about, it's sort of loosely based off um, Hollywood arranged marriages, uh -huh. and there was a particular one about um, Tab Hunter and Anthony Perkins, um, and so it's this thing of like interacting and getting smarter about characters who, it's just not good for that, like basically it's just thing where it's like, it was in a time where it's, it pits these two gay men against a cisgendered woman, and sort of in the 1940s and where both those people are sort of at odds with each other and neither of their lives ever actually work out to be that great. And I think Medius does such a job of like, being like, the 1940s and 1950s were amazing. And it's like, <laughs> it's so easy to forget that yeah. it actually was horrible for certain groups of people. As, as a gay man myself, it's so easy to forget all of that history. And so I wanted to make a story where it was complicated and it was something that didn't have this like utopic vision to sort of give it closure. It was sort of the same with these, two, these three characters are stuck and are doing the best they can. And as a good reminder to myself, being like, oh, actually, like, I need to be more grateful for what I have in my life, what I've experienced, and also wishing that there was just more stuff that, I feel like gay stories are only ever on farms, and I'm like, why is that? <laughs> like, we just need to be better about, like, giving things, like, the complicatedness that it actually deserves, rather than sort of wanting things to be just good now, which I guess I'm ending this on like on an anti-utopia note, sorry, but no, I just really like trying to be better about, I about think that. I think that people are very complicated. Yes. <laughs> and that that's that's us. Complicated people. Mm -hmm. Trying to be better, hopefully. But um, on that note, thank you guys for coming. And um, thank I think to our panelists who did a fantastic job. Thank you.